The other thing I got interested in a few years ago, I was inspired by this little movie. So this here is a bacterium, and the back is the thing it swims with. Those are the, the um, it, it swims with these little, uh, um, these little uh, um, flagella, we call them. And what's amazing about this flagella are spun by a motor, and this motor spins at 100,000 RPM. So you have 10 times as many bacteria in your body as you have cells in your body, okay? You may not realize this. In fact, if you look at your genome, you're part bacterium. Okay. You have 10, and there's 10,000 bacteria in your body, so not because you're sick, don't go off to the hospital, but because they're much smaller than your cells and they live in your gut, most of them, and they do all kinds of good things. And what some of them do is they swim with these little, these little flagella. So while I'm speaking to you, this is happening right inside you at this time. But what's most amazing to me about this bacterial flagella motor is not the fact that it spins, but this process you're seeing right here. This is an animation from Keiji Namba's group in Osaka. And he's basically showing how we think this thing comes together. If you were to find a machine like this on the street, a big one, you'd assume it would be made in an assembly line. You'd assume that somebody, some complex set of people or some complex robot put this thing together. But these things make themselves. And this happens all the time. Your body is full of incredibly complex little machines that make themselves. And the first time I saw that, I thought, well, that's just too amazing for it. How could that happen? You know, how, who tells the protein to move in this spot and not that spot? And how does it make this incredibly complicated machine? A machine that can spin at 100,000 RPM and stop at a quarter of a turn. How does that work? It's absolutely an amazing, amazing question. Now, it turns out that this flagellar motor is a bit too complicated to study. There's too many things about it we don't understand. So I started working on something simpler. These are viruses. So viruses, are, what are viruses? They're just a shell of proteins with DNA or RNA inside. And about half of them have this icosahedral, almost spherical shape. And so this one is made of 60 copies, 12 times pentagons, or exactly the same protein. This one's 180 times the same pro protein, 12 pentagons and 20 hexagons. And if you look at an old-fashioned football or soccer ball, as you call it in the United States, you'll see that they're actually knit in exactly the same way. They have 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. So nature got there a lot earlier than we did. What's amazing about these guys, is, hey, this one's made of 60 identical units. You can put it in a test tube, take the DNA out, so all you have is little shells. Say you put 100 of them in there, and then you change the concentration, say, of the salt, you change the pH, and it'll dissolve into 100 of them, 6,000 individual units. Okay. And what's amazing, if you change the pH back, it'll pop right back into 100 individual little balls. That's pretty cool. I think that's probably the opposite of what you want to do. It's shining on the screen rather than on the people. Yeah, great. Thanks. Don't worry, I'm used, I do a lot of talks, so I'm used to these kinds of little hiccups. So. As long as you can see the, so that's, that's, that's really amazing. It's basically, so one of the things I do in my lab, here's a little assembly model. These are computer viruses where we design these little ones and we have them move around randomly and lo and behold, you, uh, they do actually form, spontaneously form viruses. So these are computer viruses, okay? But they're good kinds, not bad kinds. My system administrator gets a little worried sometimes, but uh, I told him, no, these, are, these won't hurt his computer. So, so what, what is this like? What is actually happening here? Well, this is what life is doing, what viruses are doing, what the bacteria is doing, what your body is doing is a little bit like this. It's like taking Lego blocks, putting them in a box, okay, shaking it, and out comes a fully formed train. That's what life is doing all the time, and it's absolutely amazing. So I think science is fun. In fact, I'm amazed that somebody pays me money to think about these things, and perhaps you're amazed too. The good thing, news for you, is that it's not your tax money, but it's mainly the English taxpayer's money that's paying for me to do this. Now, a few generations ago, the only way I would be able to do this is I was independently wealthy. I would have come from a wealthy family, and I'm not, so I would not have been able to do this. But nowadays, I'm fortunate enough that some taxpayer money and some private money pays for people like myself to do this kind of thing. So science is fun, and science is great. Science also has other um, kind of useful uh, side effects. So one, I fly a lot, I travel a lot, and one of the things when I'm on a plane, I like to just be quiet, relax myself, and to sleep. And so. The worst thing is you sit next to somebody who wants to have a long conversation and they're all, oh, what about this, what about that? So usually they ask you with the second question, so what do you do? So I say, I am a theoretical physicist. <laughs> and that usually does the trick. If it doesn't, okay, then I say, um, um, and I really like equations. <laughs> and if that doesn't help, I say, what's your favorite equation? Mine is the Schrodinger equation. And I've never gotten, that's been as far as I've ever had thought to go. So, Science is fun. Uh, 
it also has a few other funny things. <laughs> I've actually solved that problem. Uh, uh, I've solved that problem a few years ago, and I recommend the solution. So um, cut Mary few years ago. That's the thing. So those are the kinds of things. Science is fun. So if you any takeaway message from this is that science is fun. Science is amazing, and I think I'm very privileged. And those of you who do science are very privileged to be in a time when you can do this. And it's great. It's fun. So the question is. Will science explain everything? So will we one day understand how that flagellum assembles and how it evolves? Well, I think yes. I think one day we'll understand that. But will we one day understand everything? Will science explain everything there is to know about everything? That's a really interesting question. Let's see. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.